Then it says here in the handbook life of ancient Maya world, right? We're looking at the, this symbol again. So let me just zoom in. It says here that this symbol, right, we just saw. It says a codex style polychrome plate, late classic period, a finely painted scene on the interior of this plate depicts Hun Hunanpu emerging from the turtle carapace. All right, he's emerging from the turtle. All right, 
the hero twins Hunan Pu and Shalom Shabalanke appear on each side of their father. Shalabalanke assists in the resurrection of their father as Maiz by pouring water on the sprouting corn. All right. And over towards this side, it says the Maiz God emerges from the underworld through the crack in a turtle carapace. All right. Turtle. Then right here, it says the ancient Maya new perspective by Heather Irene McKilcock. And it says here that one theme shows a scene of hero twins with their father as he emerges from the carapace of a turtle metamorphically, metaphorically. This image refers to the emergence of the Maiz God from Shibalba as the turtle symbolized the earth floating on the sea. All right, the turtle, turtle island, the turtle symbolized the earth floating on the sea, which is the underworld. The rebirth of Hun, Hunampu, Apu, Ampu, as the Maiz God symbolized the renewal of life and sowing of corn on earth. All right, just like Osiris. And again, the turtle symbolized the earth floating on the sea. Turtle Island, you see where they get these legends are all similar. Even in North America, right? It's called North America Turtle Island. So we're going to see, I was showing this for a reason, so we can see later. They're going to, uh, Augustus Le Plajon in his books. He's going to try to explain some uh, some of the hieroglyphics, some Maya hieroglyphics, and, and it relates to this, the word Mayak, or Maya, Mayak, what is the meaning behind it, all right? And it has a lot to do with what we're just hearing, reading right now, so it's crazy, so let's get into it. Indiana Jones, all right, so it says Queen Mu and the Egyptian Finx. All right, so there was, again, the book by uh, Augustus Le Plajon. In the legend explanatory of his object and drawing, that charts as in many other places in his book he gives the serpent head Khan serpent head Khan south a symbol of the southern continent the southern continent he represents the northern by his monogram All right look at that it looks like an X right that reads Ak turtle turtle the north turtle island North America turtle island turtle all right, so real quick, you know, we're just talking about Turtle Island, you know, Turtle Island, right? Yeah, we're just talking about, uh, you know, Turtle Island right here, you know, with the big giant trees and stuff. All right, so just to correlate, you know, we all know North American mythology. Shout out to a new breed for the stories he puts on his channel. There's actually a great one there about the Turtle Island story, creation story. Um, but as it says here on Wikipedia, just some general info, just so you guys can see that it's not just in Central America, you know. Um, Turtle Island is a name for Earth or North America, used by some indigenous peoples in Canada and the United States, as well as by some indigenous rights activists. The name is based on a common North American indigenous creation story all right creation right first creation when the land first came out creation like genesis creation land coming out of water my yuck turtle right above water my yuck first out of the water remember the lenape story of the great turtle was first recorded by europeans between 1678 and 1680 by jasper dank Karitz. the story is shared by other northeastern woodland tribes notably those of the iroquois confederacy According to the Iroquois oral tradition, the earth was the thought of a ruler of a great island which floats in space and is a place of eternal peace. Sky woman fell down to the earth when it was covered with water, or more specifically, when there was a great cloud sea. Various animals tried to swim to the bottom of the ocean to bring back dirt to create land. Muxrat succeeded in gathering dirt, which was placed on the back of a turtle. This dirt began to multiply and also caused the turtle to grow bigger. The turtle continued to grow bigger and bigger and the dirt continued to multiply until it became a huge expanse of land. Thus, when Iroquois cultures refer to the earth, they often call it Turtle Island. According to Converse and Parker, the Iroquois faith shared with other religions the belief that the earth is supported by a gigantic turtle. In the Seneca language, the mythical turtle is called Hang Nu Na or Hanu Na, while the name for everyday turtle is Hanowa. Awa. But check out how close this is, ha nu na tu hanampu, hanapu, hanupa, hanuna, hanumpu. While the name for every day turtle is hanowa. 
All right. So real quick, I just wanted to get into uh, this, you know, well, this, you know, mythology, they call it, or history of the Mayas, right? And it says the sea turtle in the Mayas. All right. Posted by Jose Diaz, December 10th, 2019. Mayan culture. Right? This is an image here. It says the Mayas found in nature a unique source of inspiration that allowed them to understand everything around them. For them, there were no difference between animals and plants. They all belonged to the same plane. And even some of these animals were personifications or reincarnations of divine energies. Among all these animals, we can count the jaguar, the snake, and the turtle. All right? The turtle is one that had a fundamental role as the origin of life for this culture. All right? Origin of life, turtle. All right? Now look at this uh, symbol right here. All right? This is a Mayan glyph. This is an old one. This was obviously painted, but you see, you see some aboriginals there. So this is Hun Hunampu, all right, the Maya Maiz god. He was born. He came out of the shell of the turtle. And the turtle represents the earth and the water below it, and the plains. All right, this is the underworld under it. All right, and he's like a Maiz, and the sprout in him. All right, and this is basically what in Egypt would be like almost the same as Osiris because Osiris was a corn deity and it was the same thing. All right. So it's thought you'd like to know that. It says, although the records of the relationship between the Mayans and the sea turtle are few, we can still find them in different manifestations of them in different cases. In the ancient world, it had a special symbolism as a representation of the earth. All right. Representation of the earth, turtle island, Par excellence for its stability. Excellent for stability as well. It's close relationship with water. Remember that water. Wata, ma, the ma, the mem, wata, and constellations. The sea turtle was not only important within the Mayan cosmogony, but also for other cultures in Mesoamerica that related its shell to the celestial vault. Its shell to the celestial vault. They're talking about the firmament, the shell, the top of it, and the animal's body was the axis that united both heaven and earth, all right? Among the vestiges of the great Maya cities, we also find representation of this fantastic animal in Uxmal with the House of Turtles, which is located near Governor's Palace or in Chichen Itza in the building known as the Church, all right? Here we go. So it says Uxmal, right? The Temple of the Turtles, all right? Look at that. Temple of the Turtles. All right, so now real quick, we're talking about Hun Hunapu, right? He came out of the turtle, right? Part of the creation story, the corn, he came up as corn, right? Just like Osiris, just like almost gets a cold. Hun Hunapu. Now it says here, or head Apu. Apu. Hunapu. Apu is a figure in Maya mythology. According to Popo Vuh, he was the father of the Maya hero twins. Head Apu. Kuna Pu or Het Apu Apu. All right. So Apu, right? The Het Apu Apu, right? A Pu or An Pu. Who's An Pu? Anubis, also called Ampu. This is actually his real name. Ampu Apu Ampu Apu Apu Het Apu Apu Hunung Han Ampu Apu. Again, as it says here in the Britannic Encyclopedia, Anubis' name is Ampu, Anubis, right? Who's Anubis? Who is Anubis again?
financial load, one of the deities described in the Codex Borgia says here, all right, says, was the god with associations to both lightning and death. He was associated with the sunset and would guard the sun as it traveled through the underworld every night. Dogs were associated with Shalot. This deity and a dog were believed to lead the soul on its journey to the underworld. Ancient Egypt Online Anubis is one of the most iconic gods of ancient Egypt. Anubis is the Greek version of his name. The ancient Egyptians knew him as Ampu or Impu. Anubis was an extremely ancient deity whose name appears in the oldest Mastabas of the Old Kingdom in the pyramid text as a guardian and protector of the dead. All right, just like Shalot, all right, we're talking about ancient Egypt, we're talking about America. He was originally a god of the underworld, but became associated specifically with the embalming process and funeral rites. Again, this deity and a dog were believed to lead the soul on his journey to the underworld. Again, Shalot, right? We related him to Anubis, says, he is believed to lead the soul on its journey to the underworld. Like many ancient Egyptian deities, Anubis assumed different roles in various contexts, depicted as protector of graves as early as the first dynasty, 3100 BC. Anubis was also embalmer by the Middle Kingdom, was replaced by Osiris in his role as Lord of the Underworld. All right, Osiris slash AKA. Man, these are all epithets of Thoth, and we know Anubis is Herm Anubis. We're going to get into that. It's basically Thoth. Hermes is a new uh, Thoth. One of his prominent roles was a god who ushered souls into the afterlife. Again, archaeological evidence has been found in the tombs of Kalima, Mayan, Toltec, Sapotec, and Aztec Native Americans, dating the breed to over 3,500 years ago. Long regarded as guardians and protectors, the indigenous peoples believed that the Sholo would safeguard the home from evil spirits as well as intruders. In ancient times, the Sholos were often sacrificed and then buried with their owners to act as a guide to the soul on its journey to the underworld. Guide of Souls By the late Pharaonic era, 664 BC to 332 BC, Anubis was often depicted as guiding individuals across the threshold from the world of the living to the afterlife. Again, Anubis was, all, was often depicted as guiding individuals across the threshold from the world of the living to the afterlife. Sholos were considered sacred dogs by the Aztecs, Toltecs, Maya, and other groups. They were also useful companion animals. According to Aztec mythology, the god Sholot made the Xolitkuntli from a silver of the bone of life from which all mankind was made. Shalot gave this gift to man with the instruction to guard it with his life. In exchange, it would guide man through the dangers of Mictlan, the world of death, toward the evening star in the heavens. Xolicuintli is, of course, a breed of dog here in Mexico, often shortened to Sholo. These beautiful, often black, hairless, and therefore fleeless dogs were almost extinct, but connected efforts to rescue it have been successful. It is believed to be one of the world's oldest and rarest breeds dating to 3,000 to 7,000 years. 3,000 to 7,000 years. If I'm talking about ancient Egypt, I'm talking about America. All right, people? In pre-Hispanic times, they were considered sacred with healing properties both for the body and the soul. In Potemic period, when Egypt became a Hellenistic kingdom ruled by Greek pharaohs, Anubis was merged with the Greek god Hermes or Thoth, right? Hermes is Thoth, becoming Hermanubis. So I told you Anubis is Thoth, the underworld. You know, Thoth is an epithet. He created all these epithets. He's the jackal. He's the hijack. The two gods were considered similar because they both guided souls to the afterlife. A common belief across Mesoamerican region is that a dog carries the newly deceased across a body of water in the afterlife. As in many other cultures, Earlier and later, the dog was seen as a kind of intermediary between worlds who could act as a guide. This is most clearly seen in the image of the dog god Anubis. The dog who aided and guided one in life would serve the same purpose in the afterlife. Again, just like in Mexico. 
The intimate relationship between dogs and their masters in Egypt is made clear through the inscription in tombs, monuments, and temples, and through Egyptian literature. Dogs, unlike cats, were always named, and these names were inscribed on their collars. Sholo served as companions to the Aztecs in this life and also in the, in the afterlife. As many dog remains and dog sculptures have been found in Aztec burials, including some at the main temple in Tenochtitlan. Indeed, dogs were familiar and loved by the Egyptians. This devotion is clear from the number of times they are depicted and re referenced in art and inscriptions throughout the history of the civilization and the way they were generally treated. As already noted, dogs were depicted on pallets in the pre-dynastic and early dynastic periods. During the Old Kingdom, the dog of King Khufu, 2589 BC, Taj the Hijack, Akbaru, was said to have been buried in the king's tomb with him. One of the best known dogs of Egypt was given his own funeral stele in this same era. Abu Itiyu was the dog of a servant of the king, though which old kingdom monarchs is unclear, who was honored with a burial fit for a noble. Ancient origins. Shalot, the underworld god of the Aztec. Shalot plays an important role in the Aztec belief system, and he appears in several myths. The Mexican hairless dog is sleek with a muscular chest. All right. When looking at it, one is struck by its similarities with the jackal-headed Egyptian god Anubis. Shalot and Anubis share another similarity. They are both associated with the activities occurring between death and the arrival of the afterlife. Whichever one that might be, they are not necessarily lords of the underworld themselves, but they certainly have associations with the darker side of things. Anubis was the protector of tombs, unlike actual jackals. Cemeteries tend to be associated with dogmen sightings. Anubis is also the one who weighs the heart after a person is deceased. The heart is weighed against the feather of mad meaning truth. Is this the reason dogmen witnesses so often describe the creature, gaze apparent to read their, read their souls? The peculiar similarities between the two deities will lead you to believe that they have the same origin. What that could be, I do not know. Perhaps they originated on Atlantis, if ever existed. And you know it did. Doth is from Atlantis. Indigenous peoples of Mexico had Sholo dogs as home and hunting companions. And today they are still very popular companion dogs. They are also the national dog of Mexico. Their value in ancient native cultures is evidenced by their frequent appearance in uh, art and artifacts, just like Anubis and uh, dog depictions in ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. Clay dog statues have been found ritualistically placed in the tombs of Aztecs, Mayans, and Colima Indians, as have the skeletons of actual dogs. Sort of reminds you of Anubis, the Egyptian dog god, lord of the underworld, doesn't it? They are both black, guide the dead, and have pointy stand-up ears. Ancient History Encyclopedia says here, according to, uh, to ancient Egypt, even so, just as with the mourning of the death of a human being, it was believed that one would meet one's canine friend again in the afterlife. The Aztec people believed that when they died, the Sholo guided them to Mitlán, Mictlán, their land of the dead. Many were buried with a Sholo. Dogs appear in underworld scenes painted on Maya pottery dating to classic period and even earlier than this in the pre-classic. Tomb paintings of the pharaoh Tutankhamun show him in his chariot with his hunting dogs and Ramesses the Great is depicted similarly, as in the case of Khufu and his companion. Dogs were often buried with their masters in order to accompany them closely in the afterlife. Some dogs seem to have been killed after the death of their master and then mummified while others died earlier and still others at a Sinopolis and perhaps at Saqqara were ritually sacrificed. Well, Burials across Mesoamerica have been found with ornaments or statues of dogs, and some cultures even sacrifice dogs to be buried with their owners. The people of Chupicuaro buried dogs with the dead. In the great classic period metropolis of Teotihuacan, 14 human bodies were deposited in a cave, most of them children, together with their bodies of the three dogs to guide them on their path to the underworld. Protectors of tombs in contrast to real wolves, Anubis was a protector of graves and cemeteries. Protector. Several epithets attached to his name in Egyptian texts and inscriptions referred to that rule. 
Maya burials from the classic period are frequently found with associated animal remains, often dogs. For example, in the ruins of the classic Maya city of Caminal Juju in Guatemala, a dog was found interred with a sitten skeleton, along with a grave goods offered to the deceased. The frequent finds of dog skeletons in classic Maya burials confirms the belief that dogs guided the souls of the departed on their journey into the underworld already existed at this time. The Incas kept them as companions and they were prized by Inca royalty as bed warmers. Bed warmers. Again here in Rover.com says the dog people says Sholo Origins, the amazing story behind Mexico's ancient dog breed, says the American Kennel Club calls the Sholo Itzcuintli the first dog of the Americas because it was one of the earliest dogs to be domesticated by human populations and has existed in Mexico for more than 3,000 years. All right, so it says Queen Mu and the Egyptian Finx. All right, so there was again the book by uh, Augustus Le Plejon. As to the character, this one right here, it is composed of two letters. So we got this one, equivalent to Maya and Greek letter A. You hear that? It's the same as the Greeks. Where do they get their alphabet from? All right, you see that? Equivalent to the Maya and Greek letter A, same symbol. So entwined as to form the character equal to the Greek and Maya K, but forming a monogram that reads Ak, the Maya word for turtle, turtle, turtle island, turtle. Before proceeding with the etymology of the name Mayak, Mayak, it may not be a mist. All right, so check it out. All right, so we got Maya and Ak. Mayak. So, wow. The waters and the turtle that came out of it. Ma, waters, the turtle. Wow. These two emix differ somewhat in shape. The emix is meant to designate the Caribbean Sea, the eastern part of which being opened to the waves of the ocean is indicated by the wavy line emblem of water in this instance it may also denote the mountains in the islands that close it as it were toward the rising sun the other emix stands for the gulf of mexico a, Medi a mediterranean sea completely landlocked completely landlocked a mediterranean sea the real one with a small entrance formed by the peninsula of Florida and that of Yucatan and commanded by the island of Cuba. So you see he's breaking down the, the glyph that shows the whole Caribbean Sea in Mexico and the lands of the Maya. And he's letting you know that the Gulf of Mexico was actually like a landlocked sea, like the Mediterranean. There remains to be explained what may be considered in the present instance the most important character of the ta ta table since it is the original name given in the most remote ages to that part of the Maya Empire, known on our maps as the Peninsula of Yucatan. All right, the Yucatan, Yucatan, Yucatan. We know Eber had a son named Yucatan, Yucatan, and you can even spell it like this, Yucatan, Yucatan, the brother of Peleg. Peleg in the days of Peleg was when the earth was divided. Remember they told us? So we're talking about a cataclysm. We're talking about the waters going up. I mean, it seems like we're talking about the same things here. The land just sprung. The land just sprung. The primitive land. The primitive land. The hard land. We're talking about turtle. Right? My yak, ak, turtle. Remember? Land, ma, and the why, the waters. Hmm turtle the primitive land remember what um what's his name Luis Agassiz told us that America is the true old world and the, the oldest land that came out of the primordial waters let us resume our explanation we have found that in remote times ma was the meaning of the character let us try to analyze its component parts in relation to the name mayak and its origin as an alphabetic character. It is easy to see that it is composed of the geometrical figure. All right, you see that? Flanked on each side by the symbol Emix. Who can fail to see that this figure bears a striking resemblance to the Egyptian sign 
Look at that. All right. You see? It's just flipped. It's the same thing. All right. So that's what I was trying to tell you about how he notices notice things because he knew this Egyptian old language then he started seeing the same symbols with the Mayas or within the temples I'm talking about the ancient Mayas it says that Dr. Young translates Ma so this means Ma in Egyptian you understand Mayak alright the symbol Ma Ma alright so Mr. Champollion asserts to be simply the letter M all right, that. By a strange coincidence, if coincidence there be, <laughs> the meaning of the syllable ma is the same in Maya and Egyptian. All right, same. That is, in both languages, it signifies earth, place. All right, the ma, place, mother earth, ma, mama, mother, mama, mother earth, earth, mama, wa, the wa, the knowledge. Wow. Continuing the word, and it says this place or site, says Mr. Champollion, of the Greek text, right, this is Greek, of the Rosetta inscription is expressed in the hieroglyphic part of the alphabet by an owl for M and the extended arm for A, which gives the Coptic word ma, site, place. So, same. You see how that is universal, ma. And where it originates in Mayak, over here. We see that in the Toronto manuscript, the author represented the earth by the figure of an old man, the grandfather, Mam, hence by Apocope, Ma, earth, site, country, place. Ma in the Maya is also a particle used as in the Greek language. An affirmation or negation according to its position before or after the verb. Another curious coincidence worthy of notice is that the sign of negation is also, all right, absolutely the same for the Mayas as for the Egyptians. You see that? All right, go back to the Maya. You see that? Be Bunsen says that the latter called it Nen. That word in Maya means mirror, and Nenha, the mirror of waters, was anciently one of the names of the Mexican Gulf. This also may be a coincidence. You see that? No one has ever told us why the learned hierogrammatist of Egypt gave to the sign the value Ma. So how did they come up with this? He's saying... The Egyptians that's what he's trying to tell you like how do they where's the whole history behind how they learned how to write language build pyramids it there is none it, it when they, we were growing up they taught us in school that it was like a legacy just came out of nowhere and then there was a mystery uh, civilization that united all of them and then they had aliens and all that stuff right but either way where how did they come to this sign right the value of ma how did they give that ma no one can because nobody knows the origin of the egyptians of their civilization nor the country where it grew from infancy to maturity you can research that they grew us up with all this because I'm, I'm i mean i've been a history you know i like history all my life and i was interested in history and all that and uh yeah they always kept telling that it was a legacy they didn't really understand how they came out of nowhere right and they all of a sudden they had civilization all right, so he's letting you know the same thing, same exact thing. All right, just grew out of nowhere from infancy to maturity. They themselves, although they invariably pointed toward the setting sun, toward the setting sun, the West, when questioned concerning the fatherland of their ancestors, were ignorant of who they were and whence they came. Nor did they know who was the inventor of the alphabet. The Egyptians who, no doubt, had forgotten or had never known the name of the inventor of their phonetic science at the time of Plato, honored with it one of their gods of the second order, Thoth. All right, here we go. Thoth, the Jehuti, all right, the Atlantean, right? Here we go. I told you, Thoth. He's the jackal. He's the dog. He's Herma, Nubis, Hermes, Mercury, the trickster. That's him. All right, so let's go. It says the Egyptians who 
no doubt had forgotten or had never known the, the name of the inventor of their phon phonetic signs at the time of Plato honored with it one of their gods of the second order Thoth so they gave Thoth the, the credit for creating the alphabet at least for them right but where did Thoth get all his knowledge who likewise was held as the father of all sciences and arts all right here we go and that's we get into hermetics alchemy and all that other stuff her hellenistic teachings then we get into serapis then we get into zeus and greeks and all you know and it keeps going all right, all right so, so since we just mentioned thoth in that book i just wanted to real quick since we're fresh with the your whole thoth idea i told you you know, I've been always telling you that he keeps saying that he's from Atlantis and everything. This was a correlation I had from way, uh, you know, like two, three years ago. I wanted to, when I was doing my top videos, actually. So this book is called Atlantis Atlantology Basic Problems by N. Zeroff. All right. And just want to read uh, a part of this real quick to correlate what I've been saying. All right. So here, a fascinating study of the god Thoth was published in 1898 by the well-known Russian Egyptologist B.A. Turajev. As sources for his study, he used mainly the writings of the pyramids, inscriptions on pyramids of the 5th and 7th, oh, 5th and 6th dynasty, the Book of the Dead, a collection of rituals for the dead fully compiled only in the Sites epoch and the writings of the sarcophaguses uh, of uh, the 6th and 7th dynasty. All these texts are written in the name of this of a deceased identified with one of the gods all right so then it explains a little bit about Thoth, who he was and he was hermes and all that all right we know that there is good reason to believe that although Thoth was an ancient deity he was introduced from some western land all right he came from a western land remember he said he came from atlantis himself in the emerald tablets in all ancient hieroglyphic inscriptions, he is linked up with the West. Did you know that? All the hieroglyphics, all the Book of the Dead and everything about regarding his story always links him with the West, that he was coming from the West. Did you know that? Do you even read any hieroglyphics? Do you know the history? All right. A lot of these Pan-Africans don't even read these things, don't even know or correlate this. All right. It's all over there, which was dedicated to him. The West was dedicated to him. In chapter 161 of the Book of Dead, he plays the same role that the Hellenes ascribe to Atlas. All right, we have the Book of Dead. We're going to go into this. So he's the same as Atlas. Remember Atlas? Who was Atlas? The son of Poseidon, the first king of Atlantis. That is Thoth, first king of Atlantis, Thoth. All right, in the Book of the Dead, he plays the same role ascribed to Atlas. All right, chapter 161. He supports the vault of the heavens at its four corners. In the inscription of the pharaohs, Useri An Thoth is called the ruler of overseas land. He is also called by the puzzle name of providential guide of both lands, east and west. Usually he was portrayed with the head of any beast and most his body. Statues and also portrayals on sarcophaguses was painted green. All right, so very important because the green obis, the green obis, if you didn't know, all right, I'm just going to let you know where he's from. We're at the Cornell lab of ornithology neotropical birds all right a university website and it's this is the green beast right here let me just zoom in all right the green beast right Thoth, right what does it say the green beast is a dark colored beast of wetlands and swampy woods in central and south america not from over there egypt not from asia this specific beast the green one it's actually from the Americas. The Green Abyss is resi re resident in lowlands from Honduras, all right, south to northern Argentina. This is the area of the Abyss, all right. We have them in Costa Rica, all right. This is where it's found, the Green Abyss, the Green Abyss, all right. So again, back in the book, Atlantis Al Atlantology Basic Problems. Again, he's represented as an Abyss and was painted what? Green the greeny bees from Central America, all right? Now it says here, the data on Thoth's birthplace are also interesting. In the inscription on the pyramid of the Pharaoh Pepe I of the sixth dynasty, his name is mentioned in a connection with the undeciphered name of a town, but a B.A. Turayev points out this town was not Hermopolis, which is not mentioned in the writings of the pyramids. Thoth's birthplace is named in chapter 24 of the Book of the Dead, and in the hymn of the Pharaoh Ramses, the fourth so go look this up all right it is 
It is the mysterious, undeciphered lake of the flame of NSRS. All right, so it's something to do with a lake of flame, a place where there was a lake of flame of fire. All right, mysterious, a mysterious place. All right, doesn't say he was from Hermopolis. All right, this is what they're letting you know. All right, the lake of two fires. Many ancient writings refer to the lake of Thoth, the lake of Thoth. All right. It should be borne in mind that the ancient Egyptians had no direct knowledge of volcanic activity. There's no volcanoes over there in Egypt on that side. You get what they're trying to tell you right here? Because this lake of flames, this lake of fire, that's where it's going. It's, it was a volcanic. Something happened. Now, saying if we assume that people from volcanic localities came to Egypt in some remote age, this might explain the vague references to volcanoes and why as time went by these references became incomprehensible and acquired the aura of fantasy because it became a legend because we're like what is a volcano what do you mean a mountain that blows fire now it says here there is a myth which says that Thoth saved other deities during a cosmic catastrophe on the sun which was ill after it had been abused by somebody all right that's in the Book of the Dead. Thoth's role as savior is mentioned in chapter 1797 of the Book of the Dead. And he actually talks about that in their tablets. How he said, hey, let's get on my ship. Let's go over there. All right. Further employing wings. Thoth carried the deities to the eastern side of the sky. You see, he carried them. He took them over there to the far side of the lake. Ha. Now it says all this, right? If we sum up all that we have said about Thoth. We shall get the following somewhat fantastic picture. Listen to this, right? If you do all this research behind Thoth, if you actually do research of his origin and the beginning of Thoth and everything that surrounds him, and even his own words saying, right, he came from Atlantis, right? If we sum this all up, we shall get the following somewhat fantastic picture. Thoth, listen to this, came from a distant land, perhaps that happy western land of Amenti, to marry Amenti. Amenti is America. Remember, we read that earlier. Where the souls of the dead passed on to Aru. Amaru. Aru. The plum serpent. In that land, there was a town by a large lake or sea. There was a town and a sea and a lake, a city and a lake. Oh, man. And it, in its vicinity were two active volcanoes. There was two volcanoes where Thoth is from. In a city and a lake. A city and a lake, and there was two active volcanoes. Then some cosmic event took place in the land of Thoth's birth. Something happened in Thoth's, the land of Thoth's We're talking about the Americas, right? He's from here. Atlantis, something happened. And the sun was eclipsed for a long span of time. Perhaps this eclipse was due to the eruption of a volcano. Volcano. In any case, the gods were terrified. Thoth, who was the wisest among them, helped them to flee. To the east across a large lake or sea while they were on their, their way the sun returned to its normal state there is a possibility that this myth is an echo of the catastrophe that overwhelmed atlantis all right all right so think about this all right Thoth told you himself he's coming from atlantis now that if you look at all the uh, ancient history behind him in egypt he came from a lake of fire, a place where there was volcanoes, a distant land, a distant land of the West. He was called one of the Westerners. A lot of the gods were called the Westerners, all right? Like Osiris and Isis, Westerners, all right? Now, I want to show you, Simon. Remember, you see, he said city and a lake, right? A town or a large lake or a sea, a city and a lake. All right, so where do we find a city and a lake, a famous city and a lake? You tell me, you tell me what are we looking at right here? What are we looking at it right here, everybody? Yes, this is this is Tenochtitlan. Tenochtitlan was a city that was built in a lake. And guess what? You see these two white peaks over here? These mountain tops all the way over here in the back, towards the right. Those are two famous volcanoes, part of the mythology as well, that overlook the Valley of Mexico. All right, remember it told us that Thoth lived in the city in the lake, surrounded by two volcanoes two volcanoes look at all these tree stumps over here two volcanoes all right and these are the two volcanoes all right it says popocatepelt and ista si it says refers to the volcanoes right smoking mountain one of them is named and ista means white woman all right 
which overlook the Valley of Mexico. They overlook the Valley of Mexico and the various myths explaining their existence. The most common vari variety relates to Nahua romance and Princess Iztacihual, the warrior Popocatepelt. This tale is recorded in several different versions. All right, so there is already, again, a view. Look at that, the two volcanoes, right? View of the Puebla Valley with Pocapotén in Catu in the distance, 1906, all right? So these two volcanoes overlook Tenochtitlan, which is in the Valley of Mexico. Now again, what does it say? That where he's from, in the land of Thoth, there was a town by a large lake, all right? And a, in its vicinity were two active volcanoes, two active volcanoes, two active volcanoes, all right? City and a lake. City in a lake, this is Mexico, with two active volcanoes, all right? Two active volcanoes. A city in a lake with two active volcanoes, all right? City in a lake. Any questions? 